just joined. So make sure your Lightroom and Photoshop is open. Uh, welcome everybody to, um, to the Photoshop seminar or workshop, I'd like to call it. Um, I actually didn't release a name before, but I am calling it Tools, Layers and Masks because that's what we're going to try and do today. Um, I am going to do my usual uh, uh, repertoire of going through the standard stuff, but as I know, all of you already know it. So, you know, we're inside of divers, land based, liverboard, scuba diving. We do specialized trips and doing photo workshops, always group trips. We're expert lets, which means there's always one of us with you, and we make sure you have great itineraries. And we focus on education and coaching. So, we do always have uh, things going on, such as um, uh, workshops or talks or anything like that. And that's while we're not traveling, I call it Insider Academy, where I put all of these things. Don't have to talk about myself, photographer, yada, yada. You guys all know that already, so I'm not going to repeat myself. Most importantly, I do uh, coach a lot, and those who travel with me know that we work a lot on your photography while we travel. I also talk at dive shows. Actually, this week, I think I'm going to have one or two talks at ADEX, the virtual talk this year, so that should be released Shortly, that's about wreck photography and uh, uh, about uh, human photography underwater. Uh, one thing I wanted to know uh, uh, that I've been doing more and more of is one-on-one um, -on -one coaching via Zoom. So uh, you can book me for whatever you need. Uh, if you want to work through um, one of those programs slowly, or if you want to work on certain photographs together, or even if you want to discuss your setup the other day, we did like an entire setup, just me and, uh, and uh, the guy who just bought his whole kit. So we can do literally everything. We can also go more advanced, uh, discuss your portfolio, et cetera, et cetera. As you guys know, we've got the Insider Academy uh, Facebook group, which is only for photography. Uh, it's been quite a bit last week. I've been very busy. It's going to be announcing something uh, big uh, soon, you'll see. So it's uh, I've been a lot busier. Um, but uh, if you guys post your photos in there, I'm going to comment on them and give you some feedback and maybe some ideas. I'll try to make more challenges again, um, but please use that to um, post and so we can exchange each other. Um, you guys all know that already, but we've got all of our videos online on a YouTube channel, so um, you can find all of that there. So today we are going to start about Photoshop for underwater photo editing. Um, this is also helpful if you want to use it for other things. Um, I find this what we're going to talk about today is really the basics of what you need to understand this program. Now, a little bit of history. Um, now, already over five years ago, I decided to go full time and do only underwater related things. And one of these things that always been pushed away from me was this stupid Photoshop that I always struggled with myself. Um, and uh, I know lots of you will share that, is this feeling that you're doing something and you feel like you're getting somewhere and suddenly nothing works at all anymore. And I had this frustration and I would just eventually give up. Um, and uh, well, as a result, um, I kept this as a pet product, pet peeve, if you will, a, a fear that I cannot use this program. So uh, one time I was stuck, a dive trip got canceled um, and I just, um, decided I'm going to spend a week or two. And I did this webinar and this guy, Manny from, uh, uh, from South Africa. And he was an amazing coach, uh, did probably like 10 to 30 sessions in a week. He has like this huge catalog of a hundred different trainings and I learned so much. But what I also realized is I feel like I can boil it down for us underwater photographers to something that I'm going to try to teach you today. And that is not all of Photoshop. Photoshop is huge. So there's a lot of things that are not going to be covered. But what I'm going to try to teach you today are the three things that you need to understand in order to understand everything else. So later, if you want to look up how do you do uh, radio, radio blur uh, masks or how do I do this and that, you Google it and you will understand how to do it because you know these three basics I'm going to teach you today. So this is my attempt, and my attempt will also to give you guys a time to practice it while we're doing it. We'll see how that works. Um, I do suggest, um, if you've been on a workshop with me, I usually say, uh, close your computer. Don't close your computer because you can't see me now, but uh, don't try to do too much editing while I'm talking because you're not going to see the things that I'm pointing out. So I'm going to try to always give you a little bit of time and uh, to do things. And then you can also ask uh, what the problem is. Um, so let's try and do it like that. Uh, it's the first time uh, like this, so let's see. Okay, so Photoshop is uh, from Adobe. 
Um, it's officially called Adobe Photoshop, uh, one of the most uh, important and most famous softwares that we have uh, in all the softwares uh, outside of operating systems. Um, it's been around since 1989, and you can say that for certain industries such as photo editing, but also graphic design, uh, web design, etc., cetera, uh, Adobe Photoshop is industry standard, or at least one of the programs that are derivatives of Photoshop. Uh, because today we've got, if you look at the creative suite from Adobe, you can see there's a ton of programs, Dreamweaver, uh, Premiere Pro, all these things, but they're essentially all based on the principle of Photoshop. Some of them were purchased and integrated, but others like Premiere Pro were developed based on Photoshop. So if you understand Photoshop, you're also going to understand Premiere Pro a little bit better. One of those uh, spin-offs was Lightroom. That was actually developed uh, after it was purchased. So it's not quite the same. It wasn't developed from scratch from Adobe. And I'd like to call it like the sidekick of Photoshop, or actually today, roles are reversed. For me, Photoshop is the sidekick of Lightroom, as you'll see in a little bit. Um, it is definitely number one software for graphic design and photo editing, although there's lots of other stuff there today. Um, so uh, yeah. Uh, let me dive into what you're going to be using it for. So here's a picture. Um, Kaylee will be smiling. This is a very good day and germ channel in Palau. Um, you get basically all these fish and the manta rays feeding on the same stuff. So you get crazy barrel feeding action if you're lucky like this. But there's stuff that they're feeding on and you can see that's really messing up the picture. So you got lots of really nasty backscatter. And if you've tried to really clean up a picture with Lightroom, you'll see there are limitations, particularly when you got that much stuff in the picture. But in Photoshop, you can edit that. So you can see on the right side a picture that is fully corrected. It does take a lot of time to get there, but you can do it. So that is one of the main benefits. But there's more. Um, you can, for example, use Backscatter to create motion blur. So here you see a picture from Komodo where there's a lot of Backscatter in the water, really, really heavy current on crystal rock and uh and this eagle ray is just cruising there but you can see um that the backscatter is all in blurs but if you use specific filter that i can show you in the next session so not today then you can create kind of like a motion blur out of that um, which is a fun trick that i'll show you here's another example from a few years later in uh, komodo which is slow exposure but during the day uh, very uh, nice, I think, image because, you know, you get the uh, tongue eating parasite and the motion of the clownfish, but all that stuff in the back. Plus, you can even see that the because I'm using slow shutter and I'm using rear curtain flash, you can see that the backscatter make these like, you know, comet like trails. And so in this case, I just decided to go full black on it. And that's another thing where Photoshop is really, really good. I mean, if you look, there's also some other things. If you look the uh, motion blur, so the white part of the face that is moved is also reducing the sharpness on the face of the clownfish. And that is something that you can bring back with a, a very cool filter in Photoshop. Um, and so that is another one that I'm not going to teach you today. Um, here's an example of a photo that was actually pretty good, but a lot of detail here. Thorny seahorse lit from behind in uh, Monado. And um, you can see that that looks now really nice and detailed. I actually forgot to put the original, but I can tell you the original, there were lots of blurry elements, uh, floating things, um, and also it wasn't as crisp. So that's one of the things that you can do. Um, here's another shot where I backlit a flamboyant cuttlefish in Lembe. Um, great idea, but it, the real solution was messy. I'll show you this as well in part two. So next time we meet, uh, how much editing goes into a picture like that, but that's something that you can do. And you know what? Um, sometimes I feel that Photoshop is a way to expand on your photography because you're creating art. You know, if you're an artist, you're painting on a canvas, you're also creating things that are not there. And so why not do that with photos? Some people don't like it. I think it's just another discipline of, of this hobby that we have. So why not? Here's an, another example of sort of an inverted black and white, um, uh, which is again something that you need to do in Photoshop. And this is one of the uh, latest uh, crazes. Yeah, these uh, very simple to do actually once you know how to do it. Um, uh, and uh, and I tried it uh, with um, uh, a frogfish. So let's see if we do that in part two, or if there's going to be a part three, then we might do it then. But these are like special effects that you can do in Photoshop. 
also if you want to do like infograms so here is a, a mimic octopus the first mimic octopus i ever found and i felt like it did sort of a you know how they mimic other animals and here i felt like it was mimicking uh, one of these spearing mantis shrimps and so i wanted to make a post and i made this floating image that's also something that you can do in photoshop very easily as a matter of fact all of these uh, 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 channel designs that I make for all the videos when I upload them, they're all, or the posters uh, that, that put on Facebook, etc. That's all made in Photoshop. You can use other programs, but because I just got used to Photoshop so much, I find it actually pretty easy to use. So um, uh, this is something where Photoshop is also useful for. Okay, a couple of the basics are it said that most use editing tool in the world. Anything is possible. It, there is an amazing amount of tools. I sometimes really wonder how these guys come up with all these tools. Like how do they know what artists might want to be doing with those in the future? But they do. Um, I can tell you for the stuff that we use, definitely me, I've been using it for five years or, or yeah, five years. Um, I, I barely use 10% of it, if that. Um, so there are so many things that you can do, but we're not going to be using those. It allows you, though, to do certain things that you can't do with other softwares, and so therefore it is used, uh, uh, useful to know. I'm going to say it's complex. I uh, will tell everybody that Lightroom is not complex, easy peasy, uh, and you can like basically build on top of it. Photoshop is a bit more complex, but I'm going to try to do that today because, in my opinion, there are three things that you need to understand, and then you can master it step by step. So every time you wanna learn something in Photoshop, these three steps are gonna help you understand that. So what are those three things? Well, number one is you need to understand the tools that are available, and not all of them. Actually, again, I'm only using a, a few of them, but you need to understand basically how they work and how Photoshop thinks so that you can understand other tools when you use them. Um, the other thing is the concept of layers that we don't have in uh, Lightroom. And finally, you need to understand the concept of masks that they sort of introduced into Lightroom, but unfortunately, they are not doing it at all how they're doing it in Photoshop. So they really should have called it something else because it's, I see where they're coming from, but I don't see why they call it masks. It is misleading. And so I, I just wish they would call it something else. Anyway, these are the three things. So, uh, oops, the animation is not quite right here. Um, so. Tools are the different tools that we're going to be using. And you can see these little icons. You'll recognize them later in your Photoshop work panel. The layers are super important. But actually, I feel like once there's a couple of things you pointed out, they're not that complicated anymore. And then there's masks, which I find complicated. But let's see if I can make those work for you. The workflow, I have already mentioned this in the Lightroom. As far as I could tell, let me just actually have a quick look. Um, I don't know how many people we've got here today. Oh, 30, so that's nice. Um, let me just have a quick glance. Most uh, people look familiar. Um, so most people would have been in my Lightroom uh, talk, and so this is familiar to you. If you're new, please follow up in uh, the uh, YouTube uh, channel, Insider Divers, uh, because Lightroom is really what you should do before, because we take the photo from Lightroom in, in underwater photo editing anyway. We take it from Lightroom, we put it into Photoshop, we do something in Photoshop, and we still export it in from Lightroom, which means you have to start from Lightroom. And that, therefore, you should always start with Lightroom. Also, Lightroom is much easier, so that's why I suggest you start with that. So what do we use Photoshop for? We use it for difficult backscatter and dirt, so really substantial stuff. Um, if you remember in our whatever first or second session in Lightroom, actually, um, it's pretty amazing how much Lightroom can do these days in terms of backscatter removal. But bigger things, and particularly when it's overlapping with subjects, it's quite hard to fix. And that's what we can do here. Um, also, if you really want to change something, so if you want to, let's say, move something somewhere, so you know these horrible pictures where somebody moved the nudibranch on the whale shark head, like these kind of things are actually super easy to do in Photoshop. Um, and not saying that you should do it, but if you ever wanted to, this is the program to do it with. Um, also, if you need to do specific lighting changes, if you remember the um, clownfish that was quite advanced editing there, um, just to make that all black, it's actually quite easy in Photoshop, not so easy in Lightroom. If you want to apply special filters, change the structure, or do any special effects, that's all stuff that we do in Photoshop. 
So I hope everybody's got their computer open uh, because we're going to do a couple of quick little changes. Now, the first change we want to do is in Lightroom. So if you go into your Lightroom, you want to open the uh, settings uh, um, area. I'll show you in a second where to do that. And you want to go to external editing, sorry, to external editing, and you want to change file format to PSD. Um, that's something we should have done together in the Lightroom session, but if not, let's just all do that. I'm just going to switch to my Lightroom here as well. So here's Lightroom. You just go here in the top into Preferences. If you're in a Windows uh, computer, then it's under File. Uh, sorry, under Edit, I think. So you need to look for Preferences. Once you're in Preferences, look for External Editing. Okay, there you go. So. Um, in external editing, change this from TIFF to PSD. Change this one also to PSD. Yeah, so they should all be in uh, PSD and 16-bit. Yeah, um, and then the very important thing is down here is the template should be file name. Okay. The reason you want this to be file name is if you look here, edit external file naming. That means when you edit your picture, it will be called exactly the same, but it will change to a Photoshop file, which is PSD. But the name will not change, which means when you save it, it will reappear in your Lightroom right next to your original image. And that makes the editing so much easier. And that's why we change it to file name. OK. Now, has everybody done that? You don't have to say yes or no. I can just open the chat here, have a quick look. Okay, I'm just gonna assume that you guys all got that. Remember, everything needs to be shot in RAW. If you don't shoot in RAW, you get a lot less opportunity in uh, changing things. So, um, oh, Yero is asking difference from PSD and TIFF. Um, if you save a um, if you save a file in PSD or TIFF, you and I are not going to notice any difference. TIFF was uh, the file that was pushed by Coral Draw, which was in the '80s the first uh, industry standard. Um, you might remember it from your first Windows. There was Coral Draw on there, um, and uh, that was TIFF. Um, and I'll show you in a moment what PSD does to your files, but um, TIFF is even worse. So the files are even bigger. And if we're using Photoshop, we're staying in the Adobe world. Why not just use, uh, you know, the the tools or the uh, file formats that they suggest? So um, as far as I understand, there is no real difference for photo editing, except that the size is a lot smaller. Okay. All right. So. Um, I'm not going to go through this raw thing because we talked about this before. But here is now how we would open. Um, oh, you can see how old this slide is. It's Adobe Photoshop 2015. Um, so the way we open a picture, and would be my suggestion, is to open it from Lightroom and open it then into Photoshop. So let me just show you how I'm doing that. So I'm in Lightroom. And let's just say I'm going to take this photo here. OK, I've already applied a couple of edits. You can see very limited, but I've done a few. Now you right mouse click. And then you go to Edit In. Now it's Photoshop 2020, five years later. And now it will take a bit of rattling until the file is opened in Photoshop. And what's happening now is it is being opened in Photoshop and convert it into a Photoshop file. And that's what all the working is taking place. So you can see here, it is saying reading camera raw format, which I'll tell you in a moment. And now you can see the picture is here in Photoshop. OK, so um, guys, I am going to uh, I am going to hope that you guys uh, are just going to use your audio when uh, I'm going too fast. So I'm just going to assume that you guys are with me until now. 
So that is how we do it from Lightroom. There is also the way to open it directly into Photoshop. Okay, and I just want to do that because it shows you what happens. Because what you will see is it will open it in Camera Raw. This is the import uh, program that uh, traditionally was used to import raw files, digital raw files, into Adobe Photoshop. Um, so if you're going into your Finder, um, this is a photo I took in Hong Kong this weekend from the giant octopus. So here, if I do right mouse click open with, now if I open it in Photoshop, same thing happens. It says reading the raw file, and you can see it opens this thing, which is called Camera Raw. And Camera Raw is this, uh, you can already recognize it's kind of similar. It's like an old Lightroom. And that's essentially what Lightroom was based on. You can see there's all these little edits. They now also have texture. So you could do a little bit of your um, editing uh, here. You can do your white balance, right? So you could do some of those things, your contrast. You can do quite a few things, right? And that's how you import it into Photoshop. Now, obviously, I'm going to tell you, we don't need to do this anymore because we have Lightroom, and therefore, we don't need to do this anymore, OK? But for the purpose of demonstration, I'm just going to show you how that works. And then you see, now it says, reading camera raw format, which is exactly the same as uh, we had earlier in when we opened it from Lightroom, OK? So we have now done that. And um, what happens is we've got a raw file. So my raw files are, it's a full frame Nikon. So my raw files are 50 something megabytes large. And now if you press save, or as I'm going to deplore you to do today is to start using shortcuts. So if you press command S or control S, um, you will save and it will save it as a PSD file. And you can see the same thing. Nothing has changed. It's exactly the same. You have the same uh, details of the photo still here. Yeah. It's now already 136 megabytes. And to answer your question, Yero, um, if you did this in TIFF, it would probably be already 200. So it's even larger. Yeah. Now, I haven't done anything on this file yet, and already it is three times the size. Now, I'm going to show you in a moment how to do this, but if I just copy a layer, I do nothing, no edits, no nothing, copy a layer and save it again, it's already 400 megabyte. And this is the problem of these programs, is they create monster huge files, because essentially they're looking at every individual pixel. And if you're putting a raw file in that has a lot of pixel, it creates super huge files. And that is just something that uh, you're going to have to deal with. So um, yes, Manjula, you see, your 25 raw converts into 250 megabytes in TIFF, 10 times the size, whereas a PSD is only three times the size. That is why I do that. Um, Daria is saying, opens in Photoshop as a black square from Lightroom uh not quite sure have you changed the export settings as i um put them there earlier otherwise just try to open it from your finder or your explorer if you're on windows and just uh do right cl mouse click open with and use photoshop see if it uh, does that um color space uh roman i have already said this before i'm not that um extreme about these i usually just go with the uh, uh rgb so the adobe rgbs um, because you don't want to use sRGB because that's already JPEG. So Adobe RGB is what I use, or you can use Adobe, uh, the RGB 1998 or whatever that's called. I can't tell the difference. So don't ask me. Yeah. Um, with a PSD, you can see the thumb in your picture profile. Uh, yes, you can, but your computer has to be very fast. Right. The option for resolution 240. Okay. All right, you guys, you're going back now. So just leave that for a moment. Just open it from the finder um, because uh, you're going to get the download anyway. Um, and I am going to explain everything. Um, so everybody, please stop doing what you're doing. 
now we come to a next segment that is very important. So I hope I've got your undivided attention. Here is the work panel. Yeah. And the work panel is actually quite easy to understand, but it is also the source of all problems. Okay. So first of all, we've got the tools on the left. If you don't have the tools, you probably have something little thing floating here with these little um, icons there. Oh, I forgot my zoom tool today. Let me see if I can find that real quick in a moment. But um, this thing here in the top um, essentially uh, allows you to open the, the tools and I would just put them here on the left side. That's what everybody does. That's the most useful. So do that. And then um, the second thing is this top bar and that is very often overlooked. When you press on any of the tools, then you will see that this top bar changes because these are the tool specific settings. So every tool that you click will open a different uh, tool settings bar. And here is where you often have little clicks like sample all layers is a classic or uh, content aware is another one. These little things are very, very important um, to make your tool do what you want it to do. And when it doesn't do that, you very often have clicked something wrong here in the top. And then you've got the actual work panel on the right side. This is where you can see whatever you want to see as a quick access. And I am going to show you how I set it, but you're totally free. I'm going to show you in a moment how you can do that. But one of the Photoshop rules that I want to recommend to you is when you are lost. So when you're like, oh, it's totally not working. What's happening? The tool isn't doing what I wanted to do. Check these three and see that you're using the right tool and you haven't like changed the tool settings and that your work panel is not totally messed up. That is uh, a, a source of all problems. So here you can see different toolbars. You can see they change completely, but they have a lot of very similar names. So for example, sample all layers. Here you have sample double dots all layers. And here you've got a tick sample all layers. Every tool has different variations of the same thing and it's very easily confused. So make sure you always check those, right? Um, now I'm going to show you in a moment how to arrange the work panel. Actually, I'm going to show you right away. So let me just go in here and let back to Photoshop. Okay, so here you can now see that you can move these guys around. You can see they give you these blue indicators. That's where they're going. So if you want to take something from up here and you wanted to put it here, you could put it, for example, next to the layers. So now it would be right and left, okay? Or you could put it in between. So if you lift this up and you put it until it, this blue line appears, now you would have this in between. Now action is something we're gonna get to much later, so forget about that. The adjustments is something we're gonna need today. The most important thing is gonna be your layer panel today. So you do wanna see your layer panel and the history can be quite useful as well. We're gonna add a couple of these other ones later, but for now, those are the three ones that you need. Before I let you guys all play around is look at this top bar where you see window, right? So when you open, uh, when you click on window, you can see everything that has been activated, okay? And very often what happens is one of these just disappears. Like you can see here now, adjustments just fully disappeared. And then you're like, oh my God, where is it? If you can't find it, just go into window, go for adjustments, and there you go, adjustments is back. Okay, so um, these ones here are essentially ticked here with the little icon here. And you can see that uh, with a tick mark on, uh, you can see that these ones appear here on the right. Okay, so that's how you arrange the panel. I'm gonna give you guys a moment to uh, play around with that. So you can see on my screen, the ones, the three ones that I would like you to activate today, which is adjustments, history, and layers. And they will arrange themselves already on the right side. And then you can also save that. So if you go into window, so in the top thing there, and you go into workspace, so I've already saved mine here, Simon's workspace, you can set it as new workspace and save it. And you can call it Roman's workspace or Teresa's workspace or whatever. The advantage is if you mess it up, which you will, because that happens all the time, still happens to me sometimes, like, oh God, where did my tools go? 
then you can just go back to that and load that one and then it will be exactly how you left it. You could also make different ones where you have one for graphic design or you have one for photo editing or you even have one for underwater photo editing. So if you'd like, you can set that all up in that way. And now we're coming to a very important rule and you know I've said this a lot and I mean it, particularly in Photoshop, you really need to start doing is is shortcuts okay now i can only uh recommend it and you guys need to decide if you're going to do it i can tell you that uh, my wife is a lawyer and one of the smartest people that i know but she cannot get used to using shortcuts so she's using obviously word documents all day long and she will not do command c command v as in command copy command uh, paste which is one of the most important uh, tools that you need in all of Windows. Actually, the guy who invented that is considered one of the most important inventions in terms of software usability. Now, the other one that is super important in Photoshop, much more important than Command C and Command V, is Command Z or Control Z if you're in Windows. Okay, undo. It's going to happen like all the time. You're like, oh my God, what have I done? And you have to do Command Z. Now, if some of you guys are still on a old Photoshop, so 2000, I think 18 or 19 is when they changed it, Command Z only did one step back and it would repeat that step forwards on and off, on and off. And you would actually have to press Shift Command Z to change that, okay? If you're doing that, then remember, if you wanna go more than one step back, you need to do Shift Command Z to go further back, but I will strongly recommend that you buy the Adobe Photoshop plan and so your uh, system is always updated. The other one that's super important is Command S. Everybody please press Command S in your program. Make sure you're saving the file and then your computer will tell you if, for example, you have no space to save, which I find happens surprisingly often if somebody has only whatever, 100 gigabyte on their small old laptop, then very often, you can't even save one single file. In that case, Photoshop will also not run smooth. So um, might as well just uh, try that right now. Just gonna have a look if there's any questions in the um, chat. No, there isn't, okay. So I'm gonna show you something that I'm not using, but I just wanna show it to you. Um, so actually uh, there's entire keyboards that are made only for Photoshop, or you can buy these stickers that actually have all the shortcuts as stickers for your keyboard panel. Um, also, you can download all kinds of PDFs. Essentially, uh, what I can say is I personally work with Post-its, okay? So when I start a new program, I write these down on little Post-its and I post them right next to my computer. And that's how I try to get it into my brain because it's like learning a language or something like that. You just need to repeat and after a while, it just goes into your brain. Sometimes I, somebody asks me like, what's the shortcut for blah, blah, blah. And I just, I have to do it. I can even do it on the table. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, it's shift command I, of course, right? Because I've never ever used the function from the program. I've just used the shortcut. Long story short, you're gonna have to start using shortcuts, whatever you wanna do. You're not gonna be using this program properly if you don't use shortcuts. Okay. Before we go to the next step, are there any questions so far? Kaylee is asking if you save back into the same folder as the photo was originally. Yes, the whole point of changing the file name is that when you save it, so let's just, I'm just gonna show you guys. So here you can see this one is still a NEF, so a Nikon exchange format. So this is the raw file from, uh, uh, from Nikon, right? So I haven't saved it yet. I press Command S, yeah, it's Command Save. So now it's saved, and now you can see it is the same name, but .psd. And if we go into the Finder, you will see that here is the PSD file, 5273. So if I arrange it by name, you can see that they're right next to each other. And all going well, if you go into Lightroom, you now also see both of these. You can see here in the top is the information. Yeah, they're right next to each other. That is why, that is why we uh, change this in the settings where we say uh, file name. And so it will be right next to Lightroom uh, in the Lightroom uh, catalog, right next to your picture. 
Okay. Like I mentioned, you can also unmute yourself and just ask a question if you like. Okay. Layer logic. Okay. All eyes on the pies. Okay. This is a very important aspect. Okay. Now, Photoshop works like multiple layers of a pyramid. So the top part of the pyramid is what you're definitely going to see. If we put it into a three dimensional thing, if you see my face right now, right? Pretty man. Right? Now, if I put another layer in front of me, you cannot see my face, right? That is because this is a fixed layer. But if I were to use a transparent layer, you can still see me, albeit with some adjustments. In this case, transparent adjustments, okay? Now, there are different kinds of layers, and you only see the result of the, uh, the stacking, essentially, of all the layers. So I'm here, right? And then you've got this transparent layer, and then I put another layer in between that's covering my face or my mouth, right? or my eyes maybe, so you can hear me better. And what you see is the end result of looking through the transparent layer. You can see the top of my forehead is blocked, but the bottom of my mouth is visible. That is the logic how Photoshop works. We've got three different kinds of layers. Actually, there are more, but let's not get too complicated. There are the transparent layers, transparent layer. There are the solid layers, my hand, right? Solid layer. And then there are influencing layers. Actually, you could say this transparent layer is like an influencing because you can see there's like whatever brightness on there, right? So it's influencing how you see my face before and after applying the effect, right? So these are the different layers and how you stack them up on top of each other makes a huge difference because obviously a transparent layer you can look through, but a solid layer you cannot look through. So if you put a solid layer over several transparent ones, you're not going to see anything except the solid layer. So here is the uh, logic one more time in uh, stacked up. And essentially you have your picture. You can see this here on the layer panel on the right side. You can see the bottom part is usually the picture where we start. And then you add multiple layers on top of that. And they are different degrees of transparent or influencing. Um, and therefore, the picture that you see on your screen is a result of all of these, right? Because you're looking through all the layers. So we start with a background layer. And then we always do every tutorial and every uh, YouTube video that you're going to see is always going to start with the same step is you're going to make a copy of this background layer. That is because if you accidentally edit this picture and you mess something up, I'll show you in a moment, then you always have your original uh, picture left. And you can see there's a little lock item. That's how the program starts. You can actually take that one and unlock it if you did want to change it. But Normally, this is how we start to edit a photo. And here is my first uh, command that you are probably not familiar with, which is Command J or Control J, which makes a copy of a layer. You're going to be using that quite often. right? And then we add a layer. Um, and that layer is Shift Command uh, N for new. Or I'm going to show you the shortcut as well. Now, here is the next Photoshop rule, OK? You're going to have to follow this rule. Otherwise, you're going to create a huge mess, is every edit that you want to apply, you want to put on a different layer. Don't put them on one merged layer, because then it's very hard to undo. I'm going to show you in a moment how easy it is, if you keep things on separate layers, how easy it is to actually go back on your edits and change them later. So here is a working layer. And if I wanted to do anything to my photo, I should be doing that on my working layer rather than doing it on my photo directly. There are a couple of things in this layer panel that are quite important. And the good news is not all of them are important. I wish you could turn them off. So these here in the top are something that you only need if you've got you know, a lot of different layers. So don't worry about this top, top one. You can forget about that. Also, you've got this one, which you can pretty much mostly forget. Also, more for graphic design, so you don't need that. But what you do need is this bottom one. Although, again, good news, if you start learning shortcuts, you don't actually need to use these. I never use these. 
uh, except to show people how to use them because lots of people struggle with the shortcuts. I use all of these just by using shortcuts. And then there's two more. One is the lock button, which sometimes is useful and the opacity, but that's it. So this is gonna be in my handout, so don't worry about it. But essentially you just have to remember these ones here in the bottom, not even all of them, just these ones and the opacity and the lock button. Another one that's super important is the eye, okay? So the eye that you see here in the panel on the left is essentially telling you if you see the layer or you do not see the layer. Again, very common mistake is that you're doing something and you can't see it happening. That's because the layer is not activated, it's not viewable. So therefore, you always need to check if the eye button is on. If the eye button is off, you can't see it. I'm going to show you in a moment how that works in practice. Sorry, one more thing. Um, you can also see here these four uh, indicator squares around this layer. And this layer you can see here is in light gray. I think everybody can imagine what that means. That means this layer is selected. And this is, again, a very common problem that people have with Photoshop is you're editing and you're hacking on the thing and nothing is happening. That is because you probably didn't activate this layer and you're currently doing all the edits on some other layer. And so you can't actually see what's happening, but you're actually doing something. You just can't see it. I'm going to show you in a moment what that looks like. So these three are, uh, so this panel here is the bottom and here is where you can make uh, the different uh, things such as a new layer. Although again, I'm just going to use a shortcut for that. Um, you can also delete a layer. And finally, you can add new adjustment layers. Sorry, did somebody want to say something? You're welcome to stop me anytime. Otherwise, you can also put your questions in the chat. I just wanted to offer today to do it with audio, but maybe it doesn't work. So then just put it in the chat as usual, okay? So also adjustment layers, I don't actually do from here. I'm just telling you this is how you would do it. We'll get to the adjustment layers in a moment. So let me just go into Photoshop, guys. Just watch me for a moment and then try to do the same thing yourself. So I'm gonna go into Photoshop right here. So we're gonna take this uh, picture here of the tiger shark. And now look at it here in the right side on the panel. Yeah, you can see the picture is just this background image. And it is currently set to lock. So if I now wanted to paint something on here, the brush tool, I am now going to paint pink into this picture. Right? I'm going to make us a nice little smiley face. Okay, You can see on the right side in the layer panel, the smiley face is visible on this image. But you know that this is a solid layer. It's a picture, so it's not transparent. So if I put this behind the other layer, oh, that's what I can't do because this is locked. If I put this behind the other layer, it disappears because these are two identical images, but I've changed only one layer, okay? So that should show you what it means to have two solid layers that you can move around. Now, if I make this one invisible, okay, I'm clicking this eye icon, you can see that this layer is now invisible. It also says I can now not edit anymore. So my brush tool is not working anymore because this layer is actually not here. Let me just undo this. Okay, Command Z, Command Z, Command Z. But you can see here in the bottom is where we have the history. And in the history, you can see everything you've done. I could also go forward again, but I can also just go backwards to the first situation. So that is what the history is for. Right, so you can see if I do this, I can just play around in the history. So having the history is quite useful. So we've now got these two layers. And now I want to show you the difference to when you're doing this on a new adjustment layer. So if you're putting a new transparent layer, you can either press this button here, which is new layer. Yeah. Or you do Shift-Command-N, 
which is just a super useful uh, one to remember. And that says you're creating a layer. So if you remember that, then you don't need to do this anymore via this version, okay? So why doesn't everybody, uh, no, actually, let me do one more thing and then everybody can play around with that. So let me just go to PowerPoint one more time. There are a lot of tools that I'm gonna to explain to you guys, okay? These are just a few of the tools and I've given them all funky names to make it maybe easier for you to remember, but this is your main gang. These are the things that you're gonna be using, maybe not after today, but after the next session for sure. The ones that we're gonna be using, to, oh, sorry. Each of these tools have, you can see there's like a little indicator in the corner. I'll show you in a moment how that looks. And these indicators mean that there are sub tools available so the indicator on the eraser tool, one of the important tools, is eraser tool, which is what we need, or the background eraser tool, which automatically erases backgrounds, works better on graphic design things if you want to cut out the uh, white color background or something, or the magic eraser tool, which is for a similar function, works really, really good. You're going to have to choose one of them, and once it's activated, your shortcut, which is just E, you can see it says E here, will just select this. So often, here's another tool where people get stuck, is you've actually selected a sub-tool, you go back into that tool, and it doesn't do anymore what you want it to do. Make sure that you've selected the right sub-tool. Also very confusing, right? So when it doesn't work, just make sure you've got the right sub-tool selected. So the four important ones that we're going to use today are these ones. The uh, This is actually the, uh, what's the real name? I don't remember. The backscatter killer is what I call it. Then we've got the brush, we've got the stamp tool, and we've got Arnie the eraser. So these ones we're gonna be using today, and we're gonna start with these first two, the brush painter and Arnie the eraser, okay? They have letters. So you press this letter to select and just start using them. Most of them quite e are easy. So for example, uh, B for brush, I think most people will be able to do that and E for eraser should also be quite feasible. So with these, we can now paint on our layers. And with that, we're going to make a, uh, oh, sorry, there's one more thing I'm gonna tell you. Uh, but essentially with that, we're going to make a, a plan of what we're gonna be editing today. So you can change the brush size by pressing Control-Alt uh, or Control-Option on uh, Mac. And when you press that and then you, uh, actually, is it right click? I think it's left mouse click. Um, you can actually drag right and left in order to make the outside a bit more fringy, yeah? Or up and down to make it more solid, as in more strong. I, I'll show you in a moment what that looks like. And you can change the color, which is in the bottom left. I'll show you as well how to do that. But just so you know, for photography, we need to keep those black and white, which you will see in the last section of today. So here's this photo I mentioned about, I call it the patient, we've got lots of issues. And in a markup layer, we would mark everything that we wanna change on this program. So let me show you how to do that and then everybody can practice. So I've already created the layer. One more time, let me just show you how to do that. Shift Command N, yeah, or Shift Control N. Create a new layer. Now we've got a layer and now we're going to press B for the brush tool. We're now in the brush tool. And you remember I said the little icon here in the corner will give us more options. So right mouse click on this one will also give us the pencil tool, the color replacement tool, and the mixer brush tool, all of which we don't really need. Uh, definitely not today, but generally I never use those. So you can just leave it in the brush tool. So when you press brush, so let's say I'm in a different tool, V is the selector tool, and now I press B, I'm going onto this tool. So no extra buttons needed. All you need to do is press one letter and it will select this tool. Bottom left here, you can see <clears throat> you can see the color. So currently we've got pink selected, so you can also just select any other color that you want. Yeah, you can also when you go out of the picture, you can pip it. So here you can see the pip it. You can change the color to something that you see in the picture. Okay, so you could change it to anything you find in here, which is useful in graphic design, not so useful in um, uh, color uh, photo editing that we're doing today. Now, I just want to pick something that is going to be visible. And I'm just going to start drawing into here. And oh, well, that's a bit too thick, right? 
So if I press control option, right and left changes the size of our brush. Okay. So you can practice with that in a moment. Again, control option in Windows, it is also control option actually. You press these two, you go right, left, you get this, and you go up, down, and you get this feathering, they call that, which is how soft the outside is, right? So if you do this, you get something like that. So there's a halo outside. And if you do a fully hard one, then you get something like that, okay? It is totally irrelevant because we're photo editing. We're not gonna be using it in this form anyway, but I just wanted to show you how this tool works. Now you can see that I'm currently here on our new layer. Now, if I wanted to change that, I can call that the markup layer. You just click on it, change the name. This is our markup layer. And I can now, I'm gonna make this smaller. I'm now gonna point out the things that we're gonna correct. We're gonna take care of these. Also this shadow I wanna take care of later. We might try and take this whole thing out. And maybe we'll try to fix the bubbles. Not sure we're gonna to get to that today, which are over the tail, right? Yeah. Now. Have a look, guys. I've marked this all up, but if I click the eye icon, it's all gone again, right? So you can see it disappears and it goes. What would happen if I would move this between layer one and two? Well, you're all smart kids, so that's why you're gonna know. If I put this here in between, it disappears. Why? Because layer one is a solid layer. So I cannot see what is edited because the solid layer will cover anything. So if I move this back in front, it is visible again. Huge advantage of doing this in a separate layer. If I now activate Arnie the Eraser with E, you remember E is Arnie the Eraser. Now you can already see Arnie the Eraser doesn't look like I want it to look. That's because I selected the magic uh, eraser tool. So I'm just gonna use the normal eraser tool. You remember, you can see here selected magic eraser tool. So I use that somewhere for some graphic design. So I'm just gonna select eraser tool and I can now see that it's erasing. So if I go over here, nothing is happening. Why is nothing happening? Well, okay, asking questions into the group doesn't seem to be working, so I'm just gonna answer the question myself. When something's not working and you've checked that here, the sub tool is the correct one, which I've already done, right? It's the correct one. Then you need to look into your top bar and there's something wrong in the top bar. So let's see what it is. We can see that Okay, zoom panel is in the way. We can see that we've got smoothing activated that we don't want, right? And we can also see that flow rate is activated, which we don't want, and the opacity is activated. All of these are variations of brighten, lightening the eraser function. Now, when I go here, you can see it's now fully erasing this, but you can see it's still a faded approach, right? Now, if I do the same thing as I did before, Control, Option, and Brush, you can see that it's feathered. So if I'm gonna drag up, down, sorry, then it's gonna be solid, and now when I edit, you can see it's a clean, solid edit. Yeah, you can see now it's a clean, solid edit. Whereas when I feather it, it's not. And you will see later how we can use that to fine tune some of our adjustments. Okay, obviously I just wanted to show you guys how that works. By the way, if you want to zoom in and out, you can press option or alt and scroll wheel. Yeah, or um, you can do it also on the mouse pad. Now, if I wanted to undo all these eraser actions, I just go in my history panel, click on that one and I'm back to where I was before. Okay, so I'm gonna look at questions, but everybody please try to add, make a copy of your um, of your base picture. So make a, uh, with Command J, a copy of that layer. And then with Shift Command N, create a new layer, then select brush. And with the brush, just draw all over it. Sorry, what we got to do, I got as far as opening a picture, I'm copying it and now I've forgotten. So now do shift command N. So you're opening a markup layer. So you're opening right. a transparent layer or you can click on the little icon which says create a new layer, bottom right. Okay. You done that? Okay. 
Right, that didn't work. Do you have a little uh, transparent layer there? No, I haven't. I've got a background and layer one. So shift. So now just shift command N. Um, shift, shift control N. So, yeah. No, not oh. alt. Uh, you're on Windows, shift. so it should be shift. Oh, Ah, yeah. right, okay. Mark up there. And press Mark okay. Layer. Yeah, and now you should have that. a transparent layer. Yeah, right? got that. Mm -hmm. All right, press B. Hmm. B. Just B. Ah, oh, yeah, got it, got it. And now you should be able to draw on that transparent layer. Is that happening? Yeah. yeah. So how do you increase it by this shortcut, please? Control, Alt. Alt. Press both of those. And then click the left mouse button and just drag right and left. You can also change it in the top left. So if you want to do it manual, like I said, no. I'm always doing it with shortcuts. But you can see in the top left, if you look on your top bar where you have all your tool settings, there is a little um, thing that has a number and a size of your circle. You can also change the size in here. So size, yeah, you can change the size in here. But I find it so much better when you do it with that shortcut because you can actually see how big the circle is going to be. Yep. So just draw around a little bit on that and then let's continue. Anybody else, any questions? I don't see anything it's here in the chat. Simon, so. When, I, when yep. I click on the tools on the little arrow pointing down, I don't yep. get the options dropping out. Have I got something locked somewhere? Which one? This one? No, on the, on the, the far side panel where the brush tools Oh, this are. one. Right mouse click. Yeah, you right you mouse. said that there's, there's a right little mouse click. There, but, yeah, but right, the man right I'm mouse click. Out. Right mouse click. The right mouse click. Ah, right. Yeah, I've got to be a bit firmer with it. You got to be, yeah, and you got to be right on it. Honestly, yeah. guys, I'm also going to recommend you. Photoshop is a real bitch if you're doing it with a touchscreen. So I recommend to have a mouse. Um, I have a travel mouse that I take with me. And I, for Lightroom, don't use it much. But for Photoshop, I always use it. Also, for home, I, I just got this is Logitech's latest. Um, it's not the most expensive, but it is fancy. So it's probably like 80 US dollars, but I tell you this thing is the cream. So um, it works with Bluetooth and uh, it's rechargeable battery. So you have to throw no batteries away and it just works really, really good. I can totally recommend this. Um, I know people are always like, wow, why, do I, why would I spend $80 for a mouse? Cheapest mouse that you can get is maybe $20. Well, that's same like for a phone. Spend money on a phone. You use it every day, morning to evening. And a mouse, you also use it. This is ergonomic shaped, and it's just so much more accurate. It's just an amazing mouse. And it's not as crazy expensive as some of these other ones. Okay. Everybody good with that? Then I am just going to ask you guys to all focus back on my screen again. Uh, next step is going to be important as well. Again, not all of this you can do right away. You need to practice, but I'm going to show you a couple of these things today so you can practice them at home. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to continue. I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint. So now we're going to come to a couple more uh, tools that are super important and you're going to love using these because they are in fact easy to use. They're better than Lightroom, more options than Lightroom, and the good news is they're also faster than in Lightroom. Whereas Lightroom is quite slow if you've got a slow computer. Um, Photoshop's actually a bit faster on that. That is because you already converted it to a PSD file. Mm -hmm. So there's the backscatter killer, which is the spot healing tool. Now I remember what it's called, the spot healing tool, which is essentially what we're using for spot healing in Lightroom as well. But you're going to see there's a huge difference because we're doing it on a layer. We can actually change those effects. The other one is the stamp tool, which I never use. It's called the clone tool in uh, Lightroom. Don't ask me why they changed that. But here it's called the clone stamp tool. Um, and because it's clone stamp tool, it's S, OK? Spot healing is J. That's probably because there's too many things with S. So you're just going to have to remember that that is J. And you're going to be using it a lot, so you might as well remember using it, OK? 
Now, uh, there's a couple of things that you can press here. Generally, I would recommend that you activate it just as it is here. Yeah. Um, and again, you can change the size exactly the same as we did before, control option, and you're going to use that. Some important points that create lots of little problems are if you're not using it on a separate layer. Okay, you need to use it on a separate layer. Otherwise, the benefits versus Lightroom are not that clear. Always activate all layers. Okay, so there's different options which make sense in a later scenario, but for 99% of the things that we're going to be using it for, you want to have activated all layers. I'm going to explain in a moment why that is. Okay, and then make sure when you're editing is that you've actually activated the backscatter layer and not the picture. Okay, I'm going to show you in a moment why that is. Okay, so I'm here in Photoshop. Now we've done our markup layer, but we don't have to delete it. Look, I could press delete. Okay, and then that layer is gone. But instead, I can just make it invisible. And so it's gone. And I can just leave it there. And later I can go and look, oh, what did I want to edit? Oh, right. These are the things I wanted to edit. Okay, fine. So now if I just do the same thing, I'm just going to create a new layer. Okay. And you can see this layer is now activated. I'm going to uh, press J for a spot healing tool. You can see it's now activated here at the spot healing tool. And I'm going to use it just like we've used it in Lightroom to get rid of backscatter. So change the size, same like before, using control option size. And you can see if I just click on things, they will just disappear. Same like in Lightroom, I can either do singular click like these, and I can even just keep going much faster than I can do in Lightroom. And if it's taking some time to catch up, you can just press them all. But I can also click left mouse button and drag it over something. And as long as I bake it in entirely, it should work. Yeah, so it's now going to work a little bit and then it's gone. Okay, folks, now watch out. Big difference to Lightroom. So you can see this looks pretty good, right? You can see here on the right side that this is now all on a separate layer. So if I, for example, would make this layer invisible, all of that is back again. Yeah, so uh, for example, if you spent a long day and you've done a lot of these little edits and you've been clicking and clicking for hours trying to get all the backscatter away because you really want to submit this picture without all these nasty things, right? And you're just like, oh my God, how long have I been doing this? Well, I can tell you one thing that's really motivating is if you just say, oh, that's what I was doing. You just click it on and off and you just see what you've been doing, okay? But I want to show you something else here. So I've now done this in this layer. If I now press E for Arnie the Eraser, and I just erase something on this panel here, you can see I'm actually, I can actually bring just this one singular thing back. Why is it doing that so slow? All right? So you can see here that I've now brought back this fish. That is because it's on a separate layer. And so all the edits that I've done on this layer, I can erase. Fair enough? Right. Now, if I did my markup, I brought my markup layer back. That is the editing that I've done here, right? Here, I've sampled the surrounding and I've corrected this picture. So you can see that what is blue on blue here is when I put the markup layer, it's actually on top of this layer, but it's not actually erasing this particular thing. Watch what happens if I move the layer up on top of it, then it's complete. That is because here are just the, um, the uh, um, backscatter corrections that I've done on that layer and they're not affecting, they are affecting the uh, layer below only when they're overlaying each other, right? So if I press erase, so I use Arnie the eraser, and I would try to erase this here, it doesn't work. What's happening is I'm just erasing the backscatter that I had here, which was blue color, right? But if I wanted to erase something here, you can see it's not happening because I'm on layer two. 
Okay, let me just rename this to the backscatter layer. Okay, because I'm on the backscatter layer, if I want to delete something in the markup layer, I just need to select the markup layer, and now I can erase in here. Does that make sense? I hope it does. I know you guys can't, can't answer. But essentially, this is how you edit on different layers. Okay, so I've done a little bullshit here. I'm just gonna correct that. Okay, so this is J, okay? And then there are situations where, so you can see already that in certain situations, we might use J. So here, for example, you can see when I go into the details of the shark, you know, it's a nice photo, but I need to really go in all the details. And sometimes I just need to zoom in. And it's very good because it's all digitalized now. It doesn't take this long in Photoshop because every pixel has been loaded into this Photoshop file. So it doesn't take this much time. I can now tick each one of them and separately delete them all, okay? Even something like this, I can do. Let me take a bit more extreme example. So you see here, this here, if I do this, is not gonna work because it's taking a sample from all the colors around. It's gonna make a very horrible looking picture. You see there's like a smudge. Instead, I can use the stamp tool, okay? So the stamp tool, if you press S for the stamp tool, reduce the size. The stamp tool is taking a source. If you press Alt or Option, it actually gives you this little target icon. And with this little target icon, you're defining the source. So where do you want the sample to be taken from? In this case, I wanna get rid of this shadow that's created by the fish that's in front of it. So I could just take the white color from here. So I press the source, right? So I decide this is where I want. And when I do my first click, that defines the distance between the source and where I'm gonna apply it. So if I'm gonna click this here, you can see it's now taken these little three dots. You see the little three dots there, right? But if I go one step further, it will actually continue. So it will, the, the source you can see will move along. So if I keep clipping, eventually it starts repeating itself. So if I did this now here, right, the source would be in this black area, but I don't want that. So if I wanted to take it from here, make it a bit smaller, I can now individually correct this. Okay, so I know it seems like a lot, but essentially what we've done now, if we just turn this on and off, we can see what we have just done here, right? And we can see if we like the effect, maybe it's not that good yet. So to fine tune, I'll take a bit more from here, put that on that, right? And now obviously I could go extreme with this stuff. So for example, if we say, oh, I really like this fish, Right? If I'm in the stamp tool, I could put my source onto this fish and I could just put this fish right here. Now, okay, this is because the flow rate is not maximum. So let me just undo that. So if I just put this here, you can see it's putting the fish right there. And now watch it, you see? Because the distance is always the same. So once I set the target, where I put my first click is the distance to the source point. So if I move around, you can see if I'm here, the fish is now this is the same distance. But if I wanted to put this fish up here, again, I'm not recommending that that's what you do, just trying to explain how this tool works. So if I put my source onto the fish and put my first click up here, then that fish goes up there. Okay, so this is how stamp tool works and how, uh, um, the J works, which I always forget what the name is, spot healing tool works, okay? So before we go to the next part, I would like everybody to practice. I'm gonna look at questions, no questions. Seems to be very easy, everything. Uh, Gotham's having problems with the mouse or a phone. Okay, once again, guys, put it into a separate layer 
So you want to create a layer, not the markup layer. You make the markup layer invisible. Then create a new layer, shift command N. You can click on the name and call it backscatter if you like. Then you press J. Okay. And then you just mark over certain things. I'm just going to delete these silly fish because obviously we never want to do that. Fake fishing, that's not what we're going to do. All right, any questions on this? Otherwise, I'm going to go to the next fine tune. Is everybody giving it a go? Still almost everybody here, that's a good sign. No questions? Everybody practice the J and the stamp. I hope you can see what beautiful tools are possible here. Yeah. All right, let me go to the next tool, which is very useful. The next tool is the selection tool. Okay. The selection tool is a way how you define an area in which you're going to be working. And per definition, that means you're not going to be working in the other part of the picture. So here you can see the picture of the octopus and I've selected this area and you can do that via different tools. I'll show you in a moment. I call it the, las the lasso tool or the uh, cowboy selector and the magic selector tool, which is the selector tool. They also have shortcuts, L for lasso and W for the magic selector tool. And with these, you can create a selection in which you then edit, okay? So once you've done that, you can put your edits inside there and you don't have to worry about um, editing outside of that selection area. So um, one important thing I'm going to show you in a moment is that you have sample or layers, but also that you have this little plus icon selected, which means you're adding to your selection. You'll see in a moment how that works. I hear somebody wants to ask something. No? Anybody? Simon, yes, it's me. It's Nigel. When, I'm, when I click the, the J button on the... Well, yep. we were previously, I get a message that comes up and just it just says option click to define a source point to be used to repair the image. That should be for the stamp tool. But if you uh, again do the right mouse click, make yeah. sure you've got the spot healing brush tool selected. Because there's also the healing brush tool, the patch tool, etc. And uh, some, yep. some of those might go with. Yeah. It's what you were saying earlier, isn't it? Make sure you've got the right to. Like I said, whenever it's not working, first check if you've got something in the sub tools selected wrong, and then check if you've selected something wrong in the top bar. Yeah. Right. These are the two places where you're going to find out if you've misselected. So is it working now? Yes, that's fine now. Great. Thank you. Welcome. All right, folks. So now let's go to this selection tool. So in this selection tool, we can define an area where we want to work. Now, I'm going to show you in a moment how that works, but if you want to use the <clears throat> lasso tool, the best one is the magnetic lasso tool if you've got clean defined structures like this octopus. Although I prefer the magic selection tool works most of the times, and I'm going to show you in a moment how you can use those together as well. Okay, here are a couple of shortcuts, but an important thing that you need to understand, so please try to understand what I'm trying to say here, is if I've got the octopus selected, I am, uh, whatever I do is only going to happen inside the selection. If I press invert the selection, which is shift command I or shift control I on Windows, then you're changing to selecting everything that is not the selection. So you're switching to selecting everything else. In that case, the same brush stroke will happen outside of your selection. I'm better going to show you how that works. So I'm going to just use the 
magic selector tool. Let me just go a bit closer here on Mr. Tiger Shark. And you can see if I just go in here, it will select the form pretty well. Yeah. It actually does a little bit of calculating and you can see if it's something like this that's really well selected, then you can see that it adds quite well. Remember how I mentioned you need to have this plus tool selected? Plus tool means adding to the selection. So now if I press plus again, I can just actually click into this next area and it will automatically select this area. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you want to have sample all layers because if you don't press sample all layers, then you're only going to do that inside this, in this case, the backscatter layer, and it won't select. So if I do this now, it won't look at the form. It will look at all the backscatter items. You see now it's selected all the backscatter items. That's why in this tool, it's super important that you have sample all layers. I'm just going to undo that, go back to my previous selection. And now you can see that if I <clears throat> drag here, I could just select this whole shark. And now what would be the advantage of that? The advantage of that would be that if I'm now going to do an edit for simplicity, folks, let me just go into the markup layer. Yeah. Or let me just do another layer. Okay. So I'm just going to do another layer. Now, if I use my brush tool, so I'm going to go for B for brush tool and I want to do something in here. Now you can see if I'm brushing, it's just inside the shark. So if you ever want to know how people make these shark silhouettes, well, you know, this is how you do it. You mark it in there and then you just draw something into it and done. You've got the outside form. Of course, that's nothing that's really useful for us right now, but just so you know, that's how you do it. Let me just zoom out so you can see this. Very, very important shortcut, okay? is select the inverse. So you can see currently the inside of the shark is selected. So all my edits, if I want to paint over the fish, nothing is happening because it's only happening inside my selection. But if I press shift command I, I am selecting the inverse. Okay. You can see here in the, in the history, it's called select inverse, which means you're inverting your selections. You're selecting <clears throat> everything outside of the shark. And for those who paid attention, you can imagine what happens now. If I use the brush, now I'm painting outside of the shark. So this would be one way of, for example, <coughs> making a pink picture with a shark in the middle. Okay. So, <coughs> all right. So this is how we can edit inside or outside a certain area. So if I do, Shift Command I again, I'm now back selecting the inside of the shark. Now, what could that be useful for? That could be useful for if I want to, for example, um, do something that is just inside the shark area. Yeah. So, uh, for example, if I wanted to do um, some more spot healing, yeah. So I'm using J for spot healing. I can now do this just inside the body here and there's no risk that the blue on the outside of the shark will be affected. Okay, here, here's an extreme example, not that I would suggest that you do that, but just imagine here. If you look here, if you look here, you can see that there's some, uh, you know, the, uh, the shark has some parts missing in his dorsal fin and you know, let's just say you wanted to change that. Not that I'm saying you should do that, but let's say you wanted to do that. Okay. Then you could now just use your spot healing tool and it would just heal on the inside. You see how these two parts are now healed. That is because they're just on the inside of the tool. And therefore you can now just edit the inside of the tool, just undoing this. So you can see what we've done here. We've just used the, um, the, uh, healing tool to just edit away these two little things that are missing. That is because it's inside the selection. So let me just undo that. And now I'm going to press shift command. I We're zoomed in so you can't see the difference, but now it doesn't work anymore because only the stuff on the outside works. So now I could fix the backscatter that's on the outside. Even if it's over layering with the shark, I could, no, it's not a good example here. I wonder if the, 
yeah so for example i'm going to do a, a different example here so very important shortcut guys Sh uh, command d or control d is deselect so that means you're starting a new selection and let's say we want to approach these bubbles in here okay we want to try and fix these bubbles so first of all we're going to go into a selection tool and we're going to see if we can select this area you can see despite the bubbles it's doing a reasonable good job in selecting the the tail fin or the caudal fin yeah and we've now selected all of this let me just do a little bit more of that so we've got the shark selected okay and now let's see what we could do here again this is a quite extreme version but i just want to show you what's possible okay so we've selected the tail let's go up here and you can see the bubbles here are inside the tail if i now use my stamp tool so s yeah let's make this a bit smaller you remember what the stamp tool does right it defines a source so in this case i'm just using the top part here where we have no bubbles in the fin and i can now start painting that over here but because the the fin is too narrow so it also picks up blue so that's not a good approach but i can just go a bit closer and do it from here I just redefine my source always back into this area. It's a bit of a quick and dirty, but if you look at it, you can see that I can get those bubbles sort of removed. We're going to have to do a lot more if we wanted to really do that. Let's, for example, do that here. It's a bit more realistic example, right? So I'm just going to zoom in onto this back. Okay, and we've got here a cleaner patch that's outside of the selection, but that doesn't matter, where we have the tiger stripes happening, right? And then here we've got the bubbles. So I'm just going to do a bigger selection. I'm going to source in this area. And now watch how we are just with this stamp tool copying it over this area. Just to show you what we've done, I'm just gonna make this visible and invisible. Look at that, All right? Let me just go a little bit more extremer so you can see what next we would be doing. So I've done it here now as well. Oops, that was a bit much. All right, and you can see it's staying on the inside because it's inside the selection. Yeah. And that means we only are editing inside the form that we have decided earlier, but big problem. We've actually now also deleted this remora and that's not good, right? So now I hope I'm not going to confuse you with this, but let's just do the following. Um, so, now you can see here that we have deleted this remora. Yeah. Now, if I just undo this action, you can see the remora is here, right? So what could we do? I'm just going to command D. So I'm going to undo, uh, sorry, I'm going to unselect. So the selection is now gone. So you can see this is the edit that we've done. One more time so you can just see this what we've done all these bubbles on the back we've just replaced them with a pattern but we've taken it a bit too far the fish here is now selected yeah uh, sorry it's over printed with our stamp tool okay so i'm just gonna leave that unselected and with let's just use the other tool the lasso tool right with this tool, you can see what it does is it will layer, it will try to find a pattern and it will layer itself along that pattern. If it doesn't do it, you just make a click and then it will start from there. You can see it is pretty good. You basically want to leave it on the outside of your form. You can see he's now done a mistake here. With delete, you always just go one step back and then you can try again. And but you just 
put it to the outside of the fish. Obviously you can do this very fine, but I'm just gonna do this very quick. Just so you can see roughly how we would be doing this. Once you reconnect with the original, you just click on it and now we've made a selection of the fish. Now we did this with the shark demo, uh, with the shark demo uh, layer unselected, right? Now we bring this back. We still have the form of the um, um, of the remora in our selection, but we've now brought back the effect of our stamp tool that we've used earlier. Okay, and now we use Arnie the eraser. So we just go E for eraser. And now we're just gonna erase on this layer everything that's inside this selection. So all that stamping that we've done earlier, we're just gonna delete that, okay? Command D, and now you see it's a bit rough, but you can see now that this layer that had the stamp tool now doesn't include that for the fish. And this is where, you know, you can create quite a bit of magic. Obviously, these are pretty rough things. You're going to have to do this quite fine, but the beauty is that you can do it, right? I'm going to show you one more example. So here's the shark, right? And there's a, another selection tool that we're not going to discuss in detail. It's P for, I think, pencil, pencil tool, pen tool, right? And here you can create shapes, okay? So I'm just going to show you an example. Let's say we want to make this shark fin complete. You could create a shape. I've now made this selection in a different way than we've done before. And let's just say, oh, well, I did this a bit too quick. Have to be careful uh, where I'm taking my source from. Okay, should have planned this a bit better. Sorry, folks, but I mean, this is anyway something that we would never do. I just wanna show you the possibilities of selection together with the stamp tool, right? And now you can see we've just made him a new shark fin. Obviously, that's not what we're going to be doing, but it can be useful for sometimes when you've accidentally cut something off. For example, a fish is on top of uh, your uh, subject. So we don't really have that here. But for example, in this one, we do have that. So let me just open this one in Photoshop. In the meanwhile, everybody can practice selecting something and putting something on the inside of the selection and outside. Can everybody try that? And let's just say we want to get rid of this handle thing, right? So this is a classic case for using the selector tool. Again, I'm gonna use the pen tool here. Don't get confused. It's not something that we need to use right, right away. So that's why I didn't put it in. It's something that we're gonna use next time. But let's just say I'm gonna, <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, so I've selected this, right? And now I could <clears throat> go in and try to get rid of this thing with the stamp tool. And I could just try and do my best to get rid of also the shadow. I could do some from this, some from this side. I'm not going to do it all, but just so you can see, you can even take it from corner sites like here, and it will actually use this blue, right? Let's just do this here as well for, for fun. Okay. <clears throat> and you can see that Okay, it's a bit rough, obviously, that still needs a little bit more work, right? So there's some smoothing we need to do, etc. But you can actually get rid of something. And obviously, I can do the same with the outside. So here, I could just easily 
get rid of these things. Obviously, this is very, a very rough thing to do right now, but I just want to show that if you have something really small that's really irritating you, that's overlapping with your subject, you can actually get rid of those by using the selection tool. Okay, um, that's a kind of an extreme example. Did everybody get that? Um, any questions on the selection tool? Obviously, this is very extreme, but just to show you the potential, I wanted to uh, show you that. Oops. Nope. Yeah. Um, any questions? Nope. We are already really far over late. I'm going to want to go to the last part that I want to tell you about today, which is using the colors to uh, colors, uh, sorry, adjustment layers for colors and brightness and saturation, which we can then apply directly to the entire image or to the masks. I'm just going to skip over that because it's so late, because I want to explain you what masks are. Masks are essentially a way to apply edits to a certain area. And it is a bit confusing, but essentially you're applying a white mask on something, and a white mask means that an edit, such as brightness, is applied to everything that you can see. But if you invert this mask to black, then none of the edit is seen. And that is, I like to use this as an example. This is a little bit like a glass that is blackened with a lighter. So you blacken this glass. Don't tell my wife. Yeah. But this is now blackened. And if you look through, you cannot see me, which means the effect that I'm putting through. So if I put a, a light or something through, the light is only vaguely visible. And <clears throat> if I paint white onto this mask, then it is like you're erasing this and suddenly you could now see the light of the, um, of the phone shining through this mask. So a black mask is just like you're making an edit, uh, an, an, an edit visible or invisible, right? And this is how masks work. And I find that this is always a bit poorly explained. I just need to wipe this off my finger. It was better in my head. Yeah, <clears throat> but this is how masks work. So very important is that you remember command I. This is where you start when you open a adjustment layer with a mask or if you have a layer and you add a mask to it. And then you need to press uh, command I, which is inversing the mask, which makes it all black, which means the effect is disappeared. I'll show you in a moment how that works. And then you start brushing white onto this mask and therefore making the effect visible. Okay, it is very confusing, but that is why I said earlier you need black and white in here because you're actually switching between white and black. The point is when you're painting white, you're creating the effect, and when you're painting black, you're deleting the effect, and you therefore can fine tune. So let me show you this on an example of this guy here. That's the octopus. You can see the visibility was pretty poor. It was pretty deep for Hong Kong terms. I'm just going to, and then we'll just copy that. So I didn't do this correctly. So I'm going to do this. So let me just select this area here. So all the area that is with the uh, bad bokeh. If I want to fine tune that, I can press Alt, which means I'm now, I'm, so you can see here in the top, if I press Alt, it goes to minus, that's same like in Lightroom. So if I wanted to reduce the selection, so as in add, a bit of time, then I can adjust that with the minus. So I've now selected this area. And now when I press brightness and contrast, it will automatically create a pre-selected mask. Yeah. So you can see here now, if I apply my edits, they are only applied to this area. Okay. That is because I selected it earlier. Let's do it the other way around. So without using this selection, we learned how to use the selection, but now we're going to do it in a different way. I'm just going to create a adjustment layer with brightness and contrast. And I'm going to darken this and it's the entire picture that's being darkened, right? You can see this, right? Now, if I press command I, you can see that the mask here is now black. Remember, 
my finger and the glass, yeah, this is now all in black. Black means that none of the effect is visible. If I now go to my brush tool, yeah, the brush tool that we used earlier, this thing, and I make this maybe a little bit softer, and currently it is selected to black. If I press this little button, it's white, but again, you're gonna use the shortcut, which is X. X switches between these two colors. That's why I said earlier it needs to be black and white. And now you can paint, and it looks like it's black, but it's actually just darkness. You can see, I'm just painting this where I want it to be. So I'm painting my effects into the picture. And if I then fine tune, for example, if I reduce my flow rate, to 50% of the opacity, then I can fine tune this by using the brush tool. And so it's not as hard as the selector tool, right? So I can do, for example, just a little bit of darkening here. And let's just say I wanna do another layer because the background needs to be even darker. I can just do another brightness and contrast layer, do the same thing, inverse, get darker, and paint this again, okay? So now, I've just darkened this gradually, and I've done this in two steps. I can do it just here, or like that. That is because I'm using masks, okay? For example, here are several of our adjustments. Let's say I wanna make the octopus uh, more, more colorful, okay? So if I do saturation, we're gonna cover all these edits in more detail uh, next time. But let's just say I'm gonna do more saturation. You can see the whole animal, but also all the coral. It, everything is uh, bright saturation. Again, I'm gonna do Command I. All that disappears. And with my brush tool, I'm still on the brush tool. I'm painting white onto this area. I can now paint saturation just into this area. So watch it when I press the I button the saturation disappears, right? And this allows me to apply the effects that I want, saturation, brightness, hue. For example, here you can see now we've got the green color, but because we're not editing the whole picture, we could now change it from green to whatever, different color, right? In this case, we should change the highlights. Oops, where is it? All right, I can do brightness. I can do just the yellows and just change the yellows. See, now I get more red octopus, etc. So you can play around with that and you can knock yourself out. For example, I could also do another layer. Let's say I'm gonna do another adjustment layer on saturation where I wanna desaturate everything else, where I wanna make this less green. I just do less saturation on all of this Again, invert the layer, and then with the brush tool, I can now just brush these lower saturation in the areas where I wanna have less saturation, okay? So this is all very rough, but obviously I just wanna show you again what's possible. So these are a couple of the things that you can do with masks, and once you understand how to use masks, then you will be able to apply lots of the effects that Photoshop has on offer. And these are um, basically the three tools that I wanted to show you, uh, allowing you to brush into, so I just went a bit ahead because we were already so late in terms of time. Um, so uh, what I would like to ask you is that everything that we've done today, you will try and edit that in uh, at least four or five photos so that you can play with it, okay? So well, my camera's not focusing anymore. There you go. So um, try to remove backscatter with both tools, stamp tool and um, the um, spot healing tool. Um, try to adjust a little bit your brightness with the brush tool. Try to play with the selection tool, do some edits inside and outside. Just try to use these tools provided. I'm gonna send tomorrow um, the link to the download so that you can download uh, uh, all these tools that I've discussed today. Um, and try to practice with that. One really important thing that I wanna tell you, this is how I use Photoshop, is when something doesn't work, just type it exactly what's not happening, type it into Google. Because 
the benefit of using a program such as Adobe Photoshop that so many people are using in the world is that somebody has answered this question below before. And there's actually a, a load of YouTube channels, just like my own, but with way more detail, where they actually answer each individual question with a video. And very uh, many of these channels are very smart and they just do very short one minute videos where they are in fact just telling you how to fix a certain problem. So just type in Photoshop and then your question, for example, the selector tool doesn't work or uh, my, my eraser tool is just not erasing or whatever, and you will very likely find an answer. Of course, you can always message me or uh, put it into the group, into the Inside uh, Academy Facebook group, and that's where we can then answer those questions. So I know that was a lot, uh, but before I take uh, your questions, I just wanted to point out we have a really cool talk this week uh, from a, a professor of coral reef and fisheries. Uh, Dr. Peter Hauck, he's going to talk this week. We also have photographers coming up. I expect you guys all to attend when Alfred Minar is joining. Uh, Alfred Minar is famous for his photos, but also the way he edits his photos. Not sure how much he's going to let us know about his, uh, his little tricks, how he makes the photos look so good, but definitely he's going to share some little tricks. Um, we also have Aaron Joukowsky, um talking about uh, wildlife photography, not so much in the water, but in animal in general. Um, and uh, yeah, if you want to support the work that I'm doing, you can use the Insider Academy uh, funding page. Uh, some of you that I know have already done that, so thanks a lot for that. But uh, yeah, if you want to support, uh, I actually have to pay quite a lot of money to get this webinar software. And uh, yeah, if you want to support that, you can do that. Um, again, one-on-one -on -one coaching is another thing that I offer. So uh, just keep that in mind. If you are struggling with things, we can just spend an hour doing it together. Um, going through it step by step and I'll be able to teach you even better.